Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the concluding panel uh, of our conference, the uh, Choosing a President, the Evolving Process and Its Effects. It's part of a year-long uh, series of uh, discussions uh, on the most important uh, decision that we have to make as citizens uh, and, and the institutions and the process that condition that decision. Uh, we had an interesting series of panels yesterday and uh, uh, today, I should say I'm David Carroll from the Political Science Department for the people I don't recognize uh, in, in sitting here. Um, and uh, today, uh, our final panel uh, is, is uh, really designed to take a big look at uh, the, what we think about this system as a whole. Yesterday, we had a panel on campaign finance. We had a panel on parties, primaries, and process. We had a panel sort of on the horse race campaign this, uh, about the campaign this year. Uh, but sometimes it's useful to, take, uh, to get beyond the individual candidates and take a look at uh, the broader process. So we have an interesting panel today. Uh, the chair of the panel is Goodman Liu. Uh, he is a, a professor at uh, Bolt at our law school here. He is an expert in constitutional law, education policy, uh, civil rights law. He is a, Ro a, a former Rhodes Scholar, a former Supreme Court clerk, and uh, author of many articles, uh, scholarly uh, and popular, uh, on the board of many organizations, including an institution of higher education on the other side of the bay that will remain nameless. Um, <laughs> that's a warm welcome, of course. Uh, so, uh, he, and, and he, will, he will be moderating these proceedings, so please welcome Professor Goodwin Liu. Well, good morning, and uh, thank you for tolerating my presence here today. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, panel, which will focus on uh, the presidential primary and caucus system. And uh, it's a system that has been brought into, I think, sharp focus, of course, by the, uh, the race that's going on right now. Let me just begin by saying that, um, as a scholar of constitutional law, the last time I checked, the Constitution of the United States doesn't provide for any such uh, system. It doesn't contemplate even the notion of uh, political parties. It's nowhere mentioned in the Constitution. But at least for the last 40 years, we have had a system in which uh, the presidential primaries and caucuses have figured large in the choosing of, um, of the candidates for the presidency. And so today we're going to take a look at that process through a variety of different uh, lenses and criteria. For example, we have, looked, we have seen this year um, the issues that relate to the front loading and the, the compression of the states trying to get ahead of one another in that system. We've uh, seen concerns about the representativeness of that system. Uh, at a number of levels, uh, both with respect to whether the, the early states are truly representative of the rest of the country, whether the specific processes within states are really representative of the, of the votes and the will of the people in those states, um, also whether or not uh, the aggregate picture of the entire uh, process is truly representative of something that we might think of as um, the will of the voters. So um, on all those criteria, we will be interested in examining um, the current system. And we should ask uh, at the end of the day also, does this system work in terms of picking who we think of as the best vetted, best qualified, uh, uh, best candidates by whatever measure uh, you think of as defining best? Um, or, and uh, if there's time, hopefully we will talk about some possible reforms um, to the system. There's been so many different uh, variants of reform that have been batted around in uh, recent years, all the way from uh, having a national primary system decided all on a single day uh, to various regional types of rotating systems that, uh, that we might explore. To do this, we have an outstanding panel um, to help us uh, at least set the stage and, and begin wading through these issues. Let me introduce them from uh, the far side of, of the table uh, coming back this way. First of all, uh, to my far left is John Zaller. He's a professor of political science right here, uh, at UCLA. He's written a lot of books about political messaging and public opinion, and he's used simulation models to explore uh, the advantage of incumbency. Um, and he teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in American politics, public opinion, and statistical methods. Um, and he's served for eight years on the Board of Overseers of the National Election Studies. And he's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences 
and the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. Sitting next to John Zaller is Byron York, who's White House correspondent for National Review. He writes on a lot of issues related to the presidential campaign, judicial nominations, war on terror, the anti-war movement, and a variety of other subjects. He's the author of a 2005 book called The Vast Left-Wing Conspiracy, which examines the role that the newly energized left, exemplified by such things as MoveOn.org, the Center for American Progress, and others, has played in the 2004 presidential campaign. Sitting next to Mr. York is Ken Kachigian. He's a senior partner in the Orange County office of Brownstein, Hyatt, Farber, and Schreck, with 30 years of uh, strategic expertise in governmental affairs, complex business litigation, and public service. Um, he served uh, in the Nixon White House and later as special consultant to uh, President Reagan. He was a speechwriter and a senior White House advisor in that administration. Um, and he was also a key advisor and strategist for uh, President uh, George H.W. Bush's successful 1988 election campaign. And he's also served um, as an advisor and consultant to a variety of other uh, elected officials, including George Dick Magian, Pete Wilson, uh, Dan Lundgren, and Supreme Court Justice uh, in California, Ming Chin. Most recently, he has been an advisor uh, to Senator Fred Thompson in the 2008 race. And last but not least is my dean, Chris Edley, uh, who came to Bolt in 2004 from Harvard Law School. Uh, Chris has a long history in uh, civil rights law and administrative law. Um, he has also served in a number of presidential administrations, including the Carter administration, uh, the uh, Clinton, uh, Clinton I and Clinton II administrations, and most recently, um, and continuing, he's been an advisor to the Barack Obama campaign. So with those introductions, let me just uh, begin uh, with uh, initial comments from the, from the panel members. They'll run about 10 or 15 minutes, and then perhaps I'll pose a few questions, but really would like to hear uh, the questions that you all have. Um, so be thinking about those as, uh, as the panelists speak. So let me begin with uh, Ken Kachigian uh, to provide, first of all, a little bit of historical overview about how we got to the system that we currently have today and then some additional comments evaluating that system. Thank you. Um, uh, Dean Edley, I just want you know, I was accepted at Bolt uh, some 42 years ago, chose to go to Columbia, which is why I'm probably here today, but came back to Bolt and a great uh, dean, uh, la later Dean Jesse Chopper, helped get me through the bar exam. So uh, I'm still grateful to Bolt for, uh, for being a lawyer. Um, a little history, I guess, about uh, uh, what we're doing here today is that uh, fundamentally, I guess since I'm the oldest one here, uh, is in 1968, uh, there was great turmoil in the Democratic Party. And uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey, who actually uh, never won a primary in 1968, became the party's nominee uh, after a great tumult uh, at the Chicago Convention where there was uh, demonstrations and writing riding in the streets and, according to a lot of people, a police riot. And, uh, uh, and after uh, Humphrey lost, uh, I think uh, a lot of the party activists, especially on the left, felt that uh, what was to blame was the process and not the candidate, uh, or the process that created the candidate who lost. So after the 68 uh, campaign, they formed the, uh, uh, Fred Harris, then the chairman of the Democratic Party, formed the McGovern Fraser Commission with George McGovern and then uh, Congressman Don Fraser of Minnesota to write the reform rules for the party and which uh, uh, attempted to um, pick up on the diversity of the members of the Democratic Party, uh, uh, created uh, uh, categories of delegates and whatnot. So it, it, uh, it took the process, as they say, out of the smoke-filled rooms and into the era of reform, where now you have uh, proportional uh, representations, you have uh, certain uh, categories of delegates that have to be met. So that's, that's how the Democratic Party progressed. Of course, it, for George McGovern, who was uh, one of the members, chairman of the commission, it was a great boon because in 1971 and 72, he knew the rules better than anyone else. And for, 
For those of you who uh, want to study this history, there's a couple of people, uh, uh, Gary Hart uh, and Rick Stearns, who was the master delegate hunter, and, um, and Patrick Cadell, who was the Wonderkind, uh, one of the Wonderkind pollsters in those days. So uh, it ended up with George McGovern winning the nomination. So that's a little history. I hope that helps. Uh, the, uh, uh, I want to begin before my remarks about these reforms is the great irony of the uh, 2008 campaign. And I hope this hasn't been repeated. That I didn't come to the other sessions. But the great irony of this campaign is here California uh, went on and on back uh, a year and a half ago about how we never have any influence on the, who's going to be president. And uh, we've got to have an early primary so we can have an influence in the process. And so what did they do? They moved the primary up to February 5th, along with 21 other uh, states. And can you imagine now if the California primary was it going to be in June of this year? With uh, some 400 plus delegates, 11% uh, of the, uh, um, well actually more than that of the necessary uh, count uh, uh, to, to win the nomination. And California this year would have had a huge influence in the process. And so, just to digress a little bit, I am uh, arguing to my friends in the uh, journalism community that uh, uh, California's always had influence because the so-called money primary they have is critical to candidates getting early money to help them in the other states. So we should knock it. California's always had influence. But, but this year it would have had even more. In any event, uh, basically then what uh, this panel is about, I think, is what hath uh, the M McGovern Fraser Commission wrought. And uh, uh, my premise would be today that, uh, and where I'd be doing an academic paper on this, would be that the uh, delegate selection process and this Reform Commission process really may not have had that much influence on the direction of who the, part, uh, who the, de the Democratic Party has selected over the years as, as their nominee. Uh, I looked uh, a little bit at the history of this. If you look at the old system of picking candidates, uh, 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 Stevenson, some were uh, uh, weak, some were strong. Stevenson was in 56, is uh, running the second time against Eisenhower, was, was not a strong candidate. He was sort of a sacrificial lamb, I would say. But then the old system picked some strong candidates, like Jack Kennedy in, in 1960. And uh, despite the, uh, the outcome of the race, I would say that Hubert Humphrey was a strong candidate, and having been uh, a young uh, aide in that campaign and watching uh, Humphrey pull from 16 points behind to almost victory, I would say that he was a strong candidate because he was a great stump campaigner, and he brought that campaign back. Of course, he had a lot of help from LBJ and uh, stopping the bombing in, uh, five days before the election. But uh, still, Humphrey was a very strong candidate. Um, then after the reform, it turned out that it helped the Democratic Party produce a lot of weak candidates. Uh, you had a weak candidate in 72, McGovern, who was benefited from all these reforms. Uh, you had a arguably weak candidate, and uh, no offense, but a very weak president in 1976 in Jimmy Carter. And actually, Carter was not that good of a candidate, and uh, Ford came from behind and had it not for, been for a, a list of circumstances uh, uh, with the pardon of Nixon and the fact that Ford was a appointed president, uh, Carter would, would never have survived against a strong candidate. Uh, created a weak candidate in 1988 and, and Mike Dukakis. In 92, a strong candidate, a strong candidate in Al Gore, and a, and a mixed candidate in 04. So I would say uh, that my premise is, is that, that it's not the delegate selection process so much that influences the capability of the presidential candidate or, or who they pick. I still think that what influences the process more than anything else is a mixture of message, media, and political insiders. They still dominate. And even with the reforms, uh, these factors have had influences on the outcome of the nominating process. So for example, a combination of message, media, and political insiders uh, took out Ted Kennedy uh, basically as a candidate in 1980. Uh, took out Joe Biden in 88, it, it took out Gary Hart in 88, 
Uh, Jerry Brown in 92, who was relatively strong but made some really stupid public comments and it took him out. Uh, it hurt Dole in 88 against Bush and certainly hurt Howard Dean in 2004. Uh, and then it also helped make strong candidates and, and of course Dean, is, Dean gets on both sides. He was made by the combination of media message and insiders and he lost by combination thereof. Uh, and, um, and McCain certainly would fit in that category on the Republican side and certainly this year Huckabee who benefited enormously from the uh, early debates uh, because he excelled in them. So I think that the process is still by and large less determined by this delegate reform process that began in 1968, 19, or began in 1972, and more by the traditional elements which influence campaign. At the end of the day, I think it's still the cut and thrust, the day-to-day -day of, of political campaigns that, that end up. If you have a strong candidate with a strong message who has, frankly, a little bit of luck in the end, where I think McCain did this year, uh, you'll get the nomination. And uh, to some degree, the same with, with Obama, assuming he gets there. So if any, I'll conclude by saying that if there's any institutional change, it's my hobby horse of the stupid, insane Iowa caucuses, which don't make any sense uh, by any democratic small d standard, in my judgment. If there's gonna be, have an election, just have an election, the caucuses, I think, distort the system dramatically. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Byron? Um, I come at this uh, uh, from a reporter. I've never worked for a uh, political campaign or candidate or office holder. Um, so I, I come to this completely from a journalist's uh, perspective, although I realized a few weeks ago that uh, I am in one way exactly like the top leadership of the Hillary Clinton campaign, which is that uh, I had no plan following Super Tuesday. Uh, um, <laughs> I like the compression of the schedule a lot because I told my wife, I said, well, I'll be gone from New Year's to February 5th and then it's all over. Well, come home and everything will be great. <clears throat> so I, I have, a, uh, I guess, a personal gripe with the democratic system. Um, but what I think we're seeing here uh, in this race as it exists today is the, is the crack up of these democratic reforms of the 70s under the pressure of the particular circumstances of 2008. And I want to talk about two different types. Uh, one is the reforms to the primary system, uh, which involves the superdelegates and the proportional awarding of, dele of uh, delegates. Uh, and the other is the campaign finance system. Uh, and both were... I'd like... Hmm. I don't know. Uh, one was a party reform uh, from the Democrats, and the other was a, a, a system reform passed by the huge Democratic congressional majorities that uh, existed in the 1970s. And um, first, the primary reforms, meaning the system of awarding delegates pr proportionally as opposed to uh, winner take all, uh, and then the whole system of, of superdelegates. I think they're cracking up, not because they were a particularly bad system, um, but because you have an extremely close race right now with uh, enormous democratic interest groups' overtones. Uh, no system really works really, really well when the race is incredibly close. Um, I mean, who would have cared uh, about the, the, the process in Florida if one candidate, in 2000, if one candidate had won by 100,000 votes? But when it's close, uh, all of the flaws are brought up into the sunlight. And I think in this case it's worse in the Democratic uh, race because of the, this enormous emotional weight uh, that big Democratic traditional constituency politics has brought to this. You've got the first woman who might be the nominee versus the first African American who might be the nominee, and it, you have a close race between them, and the results are probably going to be more disappointing, I think, to the loser supporters than if it were one white man versus another white man. Uh, the reason being, um, white female Democrats have gone very, very strong for Hillary Clinton. Uh, black Democrats are voting almost unanimously uh, for Barack Obama, and I don't think they're going to be just unhappy uh, when their candidate loses. I think some of them are going to be outraged and may feel that the loss just wasn't fair and square. Uh, and their candidate was perhaps victimized because uh, uh, she was a woman or he was an African-American man. Um, and I think when it happens, uh, there, there could be a lot of blame placed on the superdelegate system. But I, 
I personally think uh, while the superdelegates are a problem, uh, the bigger problem is the abandonment of a winner-take-all system in uh, favor of proportional delegate awards. I think it's made the Democratic presidential race kind of like uh, the playground at a progressive school. I mean, nobody loses, everybody wins something, everybody gets picked for a team, and they all kind of feel good about themselves. But you don't get a winner. You don't get a quick winner. You don't even get a semi-quick winner. And I think that's what's happening in this, um, in this process. And it keeps the party, I mean, the, the Democratic Party is in a completely different mindset today for where it should be for the November uh, election. Um, and I want to talk about the other reform I think that's cracked up completely is the campaign finance reform system. Just, if you just look at these numbers, they are completely different from anything we've ever seen before. Barack Obama raises $40 million in March on top of the $55 million he raised in February. Most of it online, average contribution I think is about $98. Um, Hillary Clinton raises $20 million in March on top of the $35 million she raises in February. John McCain, on the other hand, raises $15 million in March on top of the $26 million. So he is way behind the totals for the campaign. Obama has raised $235 million. Clinton has raised $175 million. And McCain has raised $75 million. He is virtually nowhere. Um, so given that enormous Democratic advantage, which was all gained fair and square with contributions limited by the laws, uh, we are now seeing an erosion of what used to be a deep and principled um, commitment to the public financing of campaigns among some Democrats. Uh, in the past, Obama made noise about accepting public financing, which I think would be $84 million this year. But now he says that he has created a, quote, parallel public financing system uh, with all of those internet donors, suggesting that he's really kind of created a, a, a public financing system on his own. Uh, and he will likely become the first candidate in a general election ever to opt out of this reformed system uh, since its inception. Now, given the amounts of money that he's raised, I mean, he'd be insane not to. Uh, the, the, the advantage he will have over McCain is enormous. And indeed, the other day, McCain uh, said that he would probably take the $84 million because he needs it um, while Obama doesn't need it. Um, but the, it's, the system, you know, as it was supposed to exist, just doesn't really uh, work anymore. Um, it does remind me, I had a conversation uh, a few years ago with a man named Michael Vashon, who is George Soros' top political advisor. And uh, it was in 2004, and Soros was spending enormous amounts of money, uh, $30 million of his own money, to try to defeat uh, George W. Bush. And I, Soros had never given before, had never given more than $100,000 to anybody. And uh, so I asked Vashon, you know, why is he all of a sudden giving so much money? And uh, Vashon said, look at the playing field. There's so much money on the other side. This is what was available. By this, he meant the 527s that Soros was giving all this money to. Uh, today, you know, you would expect perhaps Soros to give money to, uh, to John McCain to help level the playing field, but I don't think that's going to happen. Um, <laughs> Anyway, with our current situation, I think the dream of public financing and that sort of uh, ideal is just dead. So the question is, uh, will these dead and dying reforms have to be re-reformed? And uh, with campaign finance, I think it would be good to see the whole thing thrown out. I mean, uh, I think Obama's parallel public financing system is a pretty healthy development, and I don't see anything, any problem with that and would like to see it. Um, become the way things work, and uh, if it were in effect this year and there weren't that federal money available, uh, John McCain would be in a mess, but I think Republicans would probably come to his rescue. Um, what I think is more likely to happen is that the system will just become uh, irrelevant. Next time around, uh, all the can candidates will skip the whole primary system financing, which they did this year, and then they'll skip the general election financing too, and people won't check the thing on their tax reforms, and it'll just die. Um, and as far as the reforms in the Democratic Party are concerned, um, I think that most of the problems that are the result of the close race today with all the emotions involved uh, will certainly create a lot of calls for change. And I 
personally, I think winner take all would be the way to go. They can solve their problem that way. Um, but if you leave the system pretty much as it is, and if Obama is elected, maybe he won't have that many problems with the system that he, that he worked so well. Um, it really probably won't be a huge problem unless you have another historically close race that uh, pits two major Democratic constituencies against each other. Uh, so in spite of the fact that these, these systems have kind of cracked up, uh, I think we might just see the whole thing pretty much left in place in the future campaigns, but just become less relevant, and all of the reforms will remain uh, unreformed, and I guess we'll have something to talk about next time. Thank you. Professor Zeller? Uh, it's, uh, I, I, I always hate coming after reporters because they're funny, and uh, <laughs> I'm not, and 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 he has to he's kind of used to having to hold an audience and i have a, i'm used to a captive audience people who have you know they're grateful to be able to get into my course and um, and then they're nice to me and so but i'm going to try hard and um um uh hopefully uh not not uh completely blow it here so um i like the system uh i don't think it's cracked up i think it's working well and uh, it, it's working well according to the two global criteria um, that I think are important. It's been selecting pretty good candidates, or no bozos, for about 25 years now. And, uh, and the voters are involved a lot, so it's pretty democratic. Um, but those are big, important things, and it's important to uh, keep track of them. Um, let me just go into a little bit more detail on uh, the criteria, the no bozo voter involvement criteria that I have. Uh, four criteria. First of all, I, you want a system that's going to produce candidates who are uh, politically good, good representatives of their party followings, good on the stump, as uh, Ken was saying, somebody who can give a speech, get out there and, and, and rouse the voters, but also somebody uh, who is um, a good Democrat is going to be acceptable to the Democratic blocs or, or a good Republican acceptable to the Republican blocs. All of the candidates since 1980 um, nominees have been um, good in that way. As an example of candidates who are not good in that way, uh, I had mentioned Mike Huckabee, fine man, you know, good from some points of view, but not a good man to uh, unite the Republican Party and compete well in November, in November, and he didn't get the nomination. A guy who was also not good and who did get the nomination was George McGovern. He was very pleasing to some Democratic groups, but, but, uh, but not all. So there are some bozos out there in that sense, fine people, but not good representatives of their party who haven't been nominated since 1980. And that record is not going to be broken uh, this time. A second criteria that I think is important is that the candidates have got to be temperamentally suitable. And uh, by that I mean they've got to be comfortable with the give and take of democratic politics, getting criticized and uh, not getting uh, too upset about it. Uh, candidates that I think uh, are not, were not temperamentally suitable but who I can imagine becoming president of the United States under a, in a broken system where being able to talk well and ride a wave was good. Uh, was helpful uh, would be Ross Perot and George Wallace. Uh, both of them could have, could have emerged from a free-for-all and maybe even gotten elected president of the United States. I don't think they were temperamentally suitable. And again, nothing against uh, Ross Perot especially. Uh, he's a great American, fine man. If he has any relatives here, I like the guy and everything. But he just wasn't right, you know, temperamentally suited in my opinion. I, you know, those of you who know him, maybe even especially if he's uh, your uncle or something, but I suspect know what I'm talking about. Uh, another way in which uh, uh, aspect of temperamental suitability is that the person must be responsible. Not a kind of a person uh, to, be, to go off on an ideological tangent, to do what he or she thinks is right regardless, to be wanting to, uh, to, uh, to please the, to, 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 um, to please the public and in the short run, not do the right thing in history, but be responsive to the forces that are out there in the here and now. And uh, again, that's not something that's to be taken for granted. Uh, we haven't had a problem with it, uh, but in some states they've had a problem with it. In Louisiana, they have an expression, uh, elections is when we let the fat hogs, throw the fat hogs out and let the lean hogs in. 
and that stands for the idea that candidates, uh, once they get into office, uh, are played with their friends and their, uh, and their cronies and aren't concerned about good, governments, good, good governance. So I'd say that a candidate who does that is liked by his friends, but not temperamentally suited to be the uh, President of the United States. We've had none of those guys for maybe since Warren Harding. Uh, and none of them, or even close to that, in the current system. And um, I think that's important. Third criteria is we want voters to be involved. We want to have a lot, because this is a democracy and we think that they have, the voters have wisdom. But we don't want too much democracy. Uh, and I'm going to talk more about uh, not too much democracy. But I don't think we have too much democracy. I think we have some, uh, some very suitable limitations on it. Not as, as severe as the founding fathers put on our system of presidential selection, but nevertheless, some limitations on democracy. And I think they, they work pretty well to get us the first two things that I've mentioned, because we don't want a free-for-all system where somebody who's, who's temperamentally unsuited uh, or not a good representative of his party could rise to the top. My fourth criteria, criterion, is, um, is uh, we, want, we want opportunities for leadership. And we think of, I think, oftentimes leadership in our system as, as, uh, as what presidents provide. Abraham Lincoln was a great, president, uh, was a great leader. Abraham Lincoln, I guess, was he certainly was a good speech maker. But what was important about Abraham Lincoln was that, it, was that somebody credibly nominated him for president, a party nominated him for president. And that party came into existence. Uh, uh, to make a you know, long story short, because of abolitionists, people who hated slavery and wanted to provide leadership against it. They brought down the old party system, created a new party, and put Abraham Lincoln in office, whereupon a civil war occurred, and he dealt with that well. But a lot of the leadership was getting him in office, and that wasn't him. Uh, that was a, a movement of what I call, um, uh, I and some others, I'll mention this, I can call intense policy demanders, people who really want something really bad and form a movement to get it. And among the intense policy demanders who have been important in the history of our country are the Federalists who brought us our country uh, out of a mess, out of the mess that was the Articles of Confederation, uh, the, the Abolitionists, there was a progressive movement, uh, there, was, um, there are now Greens, pro-life, pro-choice, uh, uh, pro-gay, uh, intense policy demanders out there uh, trying to lead our country in a direction that they think it should go. And, I, and presidential selection is the opportunity for them to select someone who will lead the country in that direction, uh, the direction that they want, which as I, from the groups that I mentioned there, and I could mention some other liber others, libertarians, um, gun owners, people who they have strong views about where they would like the country to go. And I think it's good that they should have an opportunity to have a say in selecting the president, even if, even if it's a little bit undemocratic. Uh, as the abolition, you know, there wasn't the, the, the abolitionist movement that brought Abraham Lincoln to power or the Federalist movement that brought us our country. That was not a mass movement. That was much more of an activist movement. And so some of those activists who want things that all the rest of us don't want at the, t uh, at the time, nevertheless, uh, do really good things for our country sometimes. And it's important to have a system that gives them an opening. And I think our system that we have gives them an opening. So <clears throat> my criteria, um, does the system do well or badly? Does it, uh, or does it, uh, does it get good leaders? Does it have mass involvement? It has mass involvement, obviously. No bozos. Uh, uh, and um, I'm going to talk about how the opportunity, oh, I should have, sorry, losing my notes here. Opportunities for leadership. I'm Obama and, uh, and Clinton right now, black and a woman. Uh, I'm not sure that either of them can win. Uh, black or woman, it's not a plus, but it's testing the limits. It's trying to do something that some people think would be a good thing for our country and the system. Obviously, it's gonna, one of them is going to be the nominee. It's going to be, uh, it's gonna be a, a, a chance to try something new and we'll see how it goes. So, so that's my evidence that the system is open to trying uh, bold new things. Okay, so uh, I said the system works well. Uh, does it work very well? Uh, my moral antenna are not so refined, but it doesn't work badly. Uh, it doesn't uh, produce George McGovern every time, uh, which was the, I, I think was a transitional system from the, from the pre-reform system. It worked badly. I think it works well. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, why it works well. Um, it seems unlikely that uh, this could all be happening by accident. I think that uh, that that, need, that um, it's, you know you need to have somebody back of the behind the scenes 
uh, in doing some sort of intelligent action, and there is. Uh, the name for it is party, political party. Uh, it takes, uh, its, its major activity is shaping the candidate fields, uh, mostly before the voters get involved in what's sometimes called the invisible primary before the regular primaries. Um, uh, it's not the superdelegates. Uh, people are equating parties with superdelegates. Parties do their best work in smoke-filled rooms behind the scenes. And the superdelegates are going to be forced now to make a decision maybe in, in, in the open. Parties don't like to do that. Parties are, are these groups of intense policy demanders who are not always extremely popular with the whole country, like abolitionists weren't, like Greens aren't universally popular, like pro-life, pro-choice are not universally popular, and so on. Parties do their best work behind the scenes. Uh, and um, so superdelegates are not, are not parties doing their work. Uh, where parties uh, do their work in this system is, as I say, in the invisible primary. Uh, that's about the year or two or three before the regular primaries occur um, when the candidates are going around uh, speaking in uh, boring candidate forums uh, and trying to um, uh, generate excitement for themselves. In most of the races since 1980, somebody has emerged as the favorite of his or her party in that period and gone on to be nominated. Uh, George W. Bush, definitely. Uh, Al Gore, Bob Dole, back to Ronald Reagan. Uh, all of these people emerged as commanding favorites in the invisible primary and voters in their respective primaries took the cue of something that they didn't really understand very well but that was happening in the invisible primary. They took that cue and went ahead and voted for them over some people who were oftentimes pretty good candidates, like George W. Bush beat John McCain. Uh, George W. Bush definitely was the insider favorite. I say that uh, based on some research which I'm, I'm going to, this is like a, 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 a it's, I'm not puffing myself, I'm just saying that I'm not saying this off at the top of my head, that's the point of what I'm about to say. Uh, um, uh, I've just been involved in a book project with Marty Cohen, David Carroll, Hans Noel, and me, it's called The Party Decides. And we gathered quite a bit of evidence, and David, ta David talked about it yesterday, about how the invisible primary works, how endorsements are made during the invisible primary, which do not follow the polls, but lead the polls and shape the polls. And that's what happens in the invisible primary, and it, it happens. And it creates a kind of a cue uh, to voters, which voters in the primaries normally take. And so George W. Bush had that cue in 2000. He beat a pretty strong candidate. And that's been uh, the tendency in most of the races from 1980 to 2000. It's not been working so well in 2004, 2008, which I'll talk about, but it hasn't been disastrous. So party, what is a, I want to say a little bit about what a party is. I said it's not the superdelegates. Uh, a party is a coalition of, we argue in our book, uh, intense policy demanders, uh, which are some kind of traditional interest groups like the Chamber of Commerce or civil rights organizations, uh, but also just activists ideological activists of the left or right, um, gun owners, greens, um, people like that, uh, have formed coalitions so that, uh, say, three big groups in the Republican Party are, say, business conservatives, religious conservatives, and gun owners. Uh, on the Democratic side, you might say uh, uh, civil rights, people of various kinds, gays, women, blacks, uh, unions, greens. So those are two different groups of intense policy demanders, and they work in coalition. Uh, their leaders and their, uh, and their active members work in coalitions behind the scenes to nominate someone who will be, within each party, acceptable to all of them. And acceptable to all of them is important. Uh, they, if, uh, if one of the major groups dissents, as the religious right may dissent from John McCain, if it seriously dissented from John McCain, it would be very bad for John McCain and the Republican Party. Now they may come around, but, <clears throat> it, but it's very important that they be, uh, accept, that the nominees be acceptable to all of them. Why? These are groups who want something out of politics. They try to form a deal among themselves to max out what they can all get out of politics by who they're gonna nominate. And um, this is what I, in another way, I would call leadership. So let me describe how that would work for, say, George W. Bush in 2000. George W. Bush in 2000 had something that none of the Republican candidates have this time, which is the united support of business conservatives and religious conservatives. And as part of getting that support, he made an implicit deal uh, that he was going to, I'm going to now focus on Supreme Court nominations, 
was going to nominate somebody who was acceptable to both of those groups, and in particular the religious conservatives. He made that implicit promise. It's pretty clear in the 2000 campaign. He didn't make it publicly. In fact, he said no litmus tests. But he made it privately, and he came through on it. And the result of that is that uh, we have two Supreme Court justices now, Scalito, uh, 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 Scalito, no, not Scalito, Alito, and, uh, and Thomas, uh, who are going to attempt from the Supreme Court bench to provide leadership uh, in a pro-life direction. And we'll see how it goes. You know, it may, it may result in significant change or it may not, but that to me is leadership. They're, they're in a position to lead the country in a direction that some of the intense policy demanders in the Republican Party want, and that's good. They're going to get their chance. Um, and the thing that was, the thing, that, uh, the thing I want to emphasize about this, this was, a, I think, an implicit deal made in the invisible primary. Uh, it's why these groups are involved in politics. And, um, and that's, what, that's, what, that's what our parties do. Those groups, uh, those, groups um, those groups try to get can control of candidates at the nomination stage by selecting someone who will do what they want once they get into office, rather than trying to influence George Bush on Supreme Court nominations at the appointment stage, which is very difficult to do. It's very difficult to, not, to influence somebody as influential as the President of the United States. Uh, but you can maybe pick somebody who's going to either have promised to do what you want or want to do what you want. That's what parties are about. And, um, and, and I think that they're, that they're effectively doing that through the, uh, through the current process. What are the institutions by which they do that? Well, the undemocraticness of Iowa, small, um, a small uh, turnout of very ideologically oriented people gives the party insiders uh, 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 disproportionate influence in that winnowing stage. Uh, it was very interesting what happened to Rudy Giuliani, who was not acceptable to religious conservatives, was leading in the polls, had more money than, uh, uh, than anybody but Romney, basically withdrew from Iowa because he couldn't get activist support on the ground in Iowa and similarly in New Hampshire. So Iowa and New Hampshire, as they work now, are giving disproportionate influence to the activists of the two parties, uh, of, of both parties. I could tell stories about the other party too. Uh, and that's, so, I, so the, un, the slight undemocraticness of Iowa is helpful to party insiders. The, um, the uh, winner-take-all feature of the, of the Republican Party, slightly undemocratic, is useful for, uh, for allowing somebody to uh, emerge as a leader in a clean way. Uh, people are upset about it. Uh, it's a slightly, uh, just only slightly undemocratic, and I think it, it strengthens the role of parties and party groups in the process in a good way. Um, um, the um, national primary, uh, if we go to that, instead of, the, uh, instead of Iowa, instead of proportional representation, you'll still see uh, the uh, intense policy demanders working in coalition within the two parties to send a queue that controls the outcome of a national primary. So I'm not sure that if we change the institution uh, in that direction that it would completely uh, destroy the kind of good party responsibility that I think we have. It might weaken it or it might throw it askew for a few elections, but they would be back. Whether it would work well or badly or better or worse than we have now, I'm not sure, but it would work uh, at least a little bit. So, um, so our system is working well. Um, I wouldn't rush to change it, but if you want to change it, that's okay because I'm confident that, these, uh, that the parties would find a way to be influential in any system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Excellent. Dean Edley. Uh, well, I agree with most of what's been said, so why don't I just not say anything? Uh, if, if, uh, it's not an option. But, um, okay, I tried. Um, Look, I want to I want to start by with a disclaimer. Right? I'm uh, I hate campaigns. I mean, I just I really really hate uh, political campaigns. Um, That's why you've been involved in so many. Yeah, there's that problem. But <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I was counting up. I I was uh, I was marginally involved in uh, eighty and. 92, 
uh, I was uh, very substantially involved in uh, 2000, 2004, and this year as a, as a uh, unpaid senior advisor. And I was involved in a senior role on a full-time basis in 76 and 88, but I hate campaigns. <laughs> um, Chancellor Bergino came back from India a couple of weeks ago. And uh, he, he said that uh, in his two weeks in India, uh, meeting with people from the prime minister to street vendors, uh, there was intense interest in uh, our nomination process, and particularly in the Democratic side, and especially around Barack Obama. And he said that uh, there were two things that were amazing to them about it. First was Obama's middle name, and the second was the openness of it. The they have, a, obviously, the world's largest democracy, and they have political parties, and they vote. But it's insiders who pick who appears on the ballot and who, who, who's going to be prime minister and so forth. And he said that the people feel somewhat distanced from that process. So from where they sat observing this intense popular participation in who was going to be the party standard bearer on both sides was completely fascinating and even inspiring. But I hate campaigns. Um, uh, I think on balance, I'm largely a defender of, of our current process as well. Um, let, me, let, me, uh, let me start with Iowa. Um, I understand Ken's perspective. Um, I hear it from my wife all the time. Um, she's working for Hillary. Uh, and uh, my experience in Iowa, however, I think is, is, is tilted strongly based on my experience there. I've been to about 85 of the 99 counties in Iowa um, when I was working as National Issues Director in the Dukakis campaign. And uh, I found this caucus system uh, and the retail politics that goes along with it, just phenomenal, just phenomenal. Um, my experience was that Iowa caucus goers are professional presidential candidate screeners, and they take it incredibly seriously. And as issues director for Dukakis, I had the experience of being in a panic every week before we sent Dukakis out to Iowa because we knew that he would be in these living rooms and in these barns, and he was gonna get cross-examined on everything from uh, nuclear missile modernization to dairy prices uh, and everything in between. Uh, and that the chief political reporter for the Des Moines Register, Dave Yepsen, was gonna be in the back of the room waiting for him to slip up. Uh, C-SPAN was just becoming a force, and CNN, and uh, increasingly their cameras were there also to catch it. So you had to be on your toes. And I saw over the, over the period of months, everybody in that field, but particularly my candidate, become better and become trained at how to lead the nation because it forced you to learn about so much and about so many different kinds of people. I mean, they're actually sort of cities in Iowa and several different industries, but you get asked about everything. Moreover, if you watched the caucus process on C-SPAN, and you have this experience of seeing committed fellow citizens arguing with each other about where the country should go and who should lead it, I think it's pretty inspiring. And having a place for that kind of interaction in our process, I think, is to the good. Howard Dean for whom both my wife and I served as senior advisors and were very early supporters. Howard Dean proved himself to be not ready because of the Iowa process. I think that they sniffed out somebody who was not ready for prime time. 
because Dean was terrific for a couple of quarters, but he plateaued, he stopped improving as a candidate, and the people in Iowa sensed that. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of a defender, strike that. I am a strong defender of the Iowa process, to some extent the New Hampshire process as well, even with the drawbacks of not being representative, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm less convinced that caucuses are useful later in the campaign schedule. In other words, after you've had that retail experience dealing with activists, trying to, trying to persuade them that you're capable, repeating the caucus process in Texas, in Nevada, in, uh, in Washington State, I, that, that I'm much less confident about. Second point, finance. Well, look, $245 million raised from 1.3 million people. Um, that's pretty cool. Um, I also, in my campaign experience, have had this sense that, um, like working with the, the activists in the caucus process, trying to engage donors, particularly these low and modest dollar donors, is another form of campaigning. Um, and uh, when you're trying to raise money in increments of, of $100 or even $2,300, it's not because you're trading favors. Um, it's because you're doing an effective job of selling your candidacy and your ideas to a broad base of people and people who are prepared to make the investment to learn what you stand for, make more of an investment than the typical voter who simply watches television, God help us, uh, or perhaps reads a newspaper every now and then. So again, I don't think it's all bad. Uh, and to the extent that the internet has created this possibility for broad-based participation in the money primary, uh, I think that is to the good. If you don't have the skill and the capacity as a candidate to raise a significant amount of money to make yourself viable, then you're not going to be a successful candidate. You're just not, and you're not going to be an effective president. Uh, so I frankly don't mind the fact that, uh, that there's this, that test of organizational capability and of, uh, of marketing capability. Um, third, length of the season. God, it's gone on. I mean, it is just, it's, just un, it's just unbelievable. And as much as there was all this buzz about Patty Solis, Doyle, uh, stepping down as campaign manager uh, for Hillary, the fact of the matter is she was flat out exhausted. Flat out exhausted. And, uh, and she's not alone. I have no idea how the candidates are doing it. They must be on drugs. But you didn't hear that from me. There was a time when Democrats argued to themselves that you know, we can't decide too quickly. We can't rush to judgment. We can't just rubber stamp uh, the party insider. Um, we need more time to give candidates a chance to, to develop, to mature, to, to become familiar, et cetera. Well, I think that was right. I mean, you can have too much of a good thing, I suppose, but uh, part of the motivation for this last round of, of uh, calendar reforms, and my wife, uh, who's a member of the DNC Executive Committee, was on the, the, uh, the, the commission that did this last round of calendar reforms, uh, was to strike that balance. Um, try to stretch out the decision-making process a little bit, but also try to put other states besides Iowa and New Hampshire into the very front, that, that pre-February 5th window. The point of adding South Carolina and Nevada was to, was to make more diverse the set of folks who would have a first voice. Now, I think, it, I think that was a step in the right direction because it certainly let both Latinos and African Americans, uh, let Southerners, let the West, uh, have much more of a voice in the way the campaign uh, unfolded, the way that the way the primary session unfolded. Um, 
the length of the campaign has been an absolute boon to the party in a lot of purple states and red states. Uh, the folks in Nevada are ecstatic. The folks in Idaho are ecstatic. Barack was at an event uh, just before the Idaho primary, uh, the Saturday before the I Idaho voting. I got a got a email from him uh, shortly afterwards, uh, after he was there. And he said they walked into, he and his entourage walked into this room, 17,000 people, uh, the only people of color in the room, so far as they could tell. Uh, and the governor told them that uh, in the Idaho caucuses four years ago, statewide a total of, I think it was 4,000 people participated. And they had 17,000 people at that one event. Now, Democrats are very unlikely to carry Idaho in November. But there will be Democrats down ballot for whom the energy that's been injected into the party will be dramatic, will make a dramatic difference on their prospects in November. And I think that's all to the good and must be counted as an important plus for the extended season. The principal respect in which I think this is bad is that six months ago, had you asked me about our ability to heal the party, I would have said, no problem. It's just tension between the two principles and a small group of people immediately around them. But everybody else is just excited to have such fabulous candidates. I think as this has gone on and on, you're seeing more hardening uh, within the party and the risk of the kind of fracture that took place in 1980 uh, is, uh, or, or for that matter, uh, 1968, uh, increases. And uh, I am, uh, I'm frankly very, very worried because I don't even know what prescriptions to offer Hillary and Barack with respect to how best to heal the party once the nomination uh, is, is settled. Um, let me just wrap up by saying that um, uh, while I uh, agreed with everything that, uh, that Ken said, uh, and certainly on the importance of message, media, and the insiders, um, I, would not, uh, I, I would not want to underestimate the importance of the personal qualities of, of the candidate himself or herself, uh, and I'm sure Ken wouldn't, wouldn't either. Uh, these uh, are extraordinary people who, who, uh, who put themselves on the line to try to win this job. Um, in a moment in history when our problems are as challenging as today, uh, they're extraordinary, crazy people. Uh, you know, there has to be something special about you if you can look in the mirror every morning and say, I can do this. I can do this. Um, I think that having worked in the White House in two administrations and seen very at close hand the pressures that face the president, you can't make a primary season too hard or too arduous. Uh, because uh, they're going to be tested in an incredible crucible. And if you don't know who you are, and if you can't handle tough pressures, uh, then you will be lost, and in turn, we will be lost. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so um, the way I like to moderate panels like this is to um, put multiple questions on the table at the same time so that we can cover more ground and uh, panelists can pick and choose what questions they want to answer. And I'll do that with my questions and also with the questions from the audience. So let me just begin with, with, uh, with three questions and then I'm gonna go right uh, to the audience, okay? Um, so question one is, several of you have talked about the role of uh, insiders in the parties, um, queuing function and the uh, uh, sort of uh, importance of the insiders relative to, say, um, uh, in, in sort of leading public opinion and leading the voters. I just wanted to know whether you thought that the Clinton-Obama narrative of 2008 is a challenge to that thesis, 
because if we had read the newspaper, say, about eight or nine months ago, one would have thought that the insiders had already kind of chosen uh, at least uh, uh, Hillary to be, the, to be the presumptive front runner or the, that was where all the money was going and there were people who have now endorsed Barack but were wary of endorsing him earlier. Uh, so, so Hillary has sort of been the insider who has been sort of cast aside in favor of someone with more sort of popular support and who is running a campaign not on the idea that he is the one favored by the insiders but rather the one favored by the people. Okay, so that's, that's question one. Question two is that um, uh, the panel touched on a number of things, but um, one of the things that uh, you all didn't touch on was um, the idea of regional interests. So one of the aspects of constitutional design um, that is reflected in the process uh, is the theme of federalism. You know, the idea that we are not just the aggregate national will of the people, rather we have allegiances to particular states. Um, and uh, I wonder if you could say something about whether you think um, state interests or regional interests are over-reflected, under-reflected in the way in which this process evolves in a state-by-state -state fashion. Okay, so that has implications, of course, for whether or not, you know, urban versus rural interests are balanced, whether uh, racial ethnic interests, interests across the country are balanced, um, and such. And third, um, here's the perhaps most tantalizing question on many people's minds. What would be a legitimate resolution of the Clinton-Obama uh, uh, contest? Process-wise, what would be a legitimate resolution? And you can define legitimate however you wish, but uh, the idea is that it should be at least something that uh, measures up against some of the criteria that Professor Zeller uh, uh, made up. We can all agree, at least as a beginning, that uh, th they are two uh, worthy candidates. But uh, candidates can they, that who can perhaps, uh, uh, here's the question, command uh, at least the uh, consensus of, of the party or the strong support of the party without the sort of hardening of feelings that Dean Edley referred to at last. So, um, anybody want to start on any of those any of those questions? Well, on um, on the first question about the insiders, um, I think the thing that's been kind of striking about this Democratic campaign is the Clinton's campaign's incredible ineptitude when it cam comes to the caucus states. Um, and uh, I think anybody a couple of years ago, uh, if they had been asked, they'd say, "Well, caucuses seem you know favor activists and insiders, and that would naturally favor Clinton." Hillary Clinton, and if Barack Obama were to perhaps catch fire, perhaps he would be do, do better in the primary states. Uh, and for some reason that is still not entirely explained, uh, they they took a much uh, big a big state attitude. I mean, some people think it's because Harold Ickes does not see a world outside of New York State, um, but I mean, certainly there are a lot of veterans of the Clinton campaign that that actually got elected twice. Uh, so it's it's. Curious, but it has yielded, and, and Obama has played it absolutely brilliantly. M one of my beefs against uh, uh, um, proportional uh, uh, awarding of delegates is Obama got more net delegates from winning the Idaho caucuses than Hillary Clinton got from winning the New Jersey primary. Now, does that make sense? It doesn't make sense to me, but it was smart on Obama's part, uh, and everybody knew the rules going in. So um, I think the, the, uh, the interesting thing is that the insiders have played uh, a, an important role, but that it was Obama who managed to play him better. Um, I would like to um, address two of them on, the ins on what would make for a legitimate um, resolution. I think the situation is somewhat like the 2000 presidential uh, election, uh, where the most important where having some people in robes behave in a decorous manner was helpful, and the superdelegates will try to do that part of it. But even more important, and I think we're going to get this too, is a gracious concession speech from the loser. Uh, I think that's about the best we're going to do, but I think that will be pretty good. On the question of uh, insider control, that's, um, that's a tougher one. Uh, but I and my colleagues that I mentioned have been collecting data on this, uh, public endorsements, uh, of various insiders uh, going back to the 70s. And uh, how 2008 looks is, well, let me say, first of all, 
that Barack Obama was not available uh, to be a serious candidate for president in February of 2007. He had never won an election out of South Chicago. He had that very, you know, he had a gift election in the state of Illinois. He had, he had never really been tested before any kind of a broad electorate. And he not, uh, 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 he, and then of course he'd only been in Washington for two years. No serious party could nom give, could, could form um, a coalition to give, an a to give the cue to a guy like that uh, given his record in late 2006, early 2007. They had to look at him in action a little bit. Um, it's, just, it's just unthinkable that, that uh, it's pretty unthinkable, I mean, surprising what's happened, but it would have been way out of bounds for somebody who'd never really faced a, a broad electorate to, to get the inside cue early. So, uh, and in the meantime, of course, uh, Hillary was a cred credible candidate and was racking up a lot of endorsements. But let me talk about the endorsements that she got. First of all, uh, she did her best to create the impression of inevitability, but uh, her endorsement totals, based on our counts, were kind of mid-range. Uh, she, was, she was not as high as, as most of the winners have been. She was like around 50 percent, 45 to 50 percent of the endorsements that were made, which puts her ahead of Michael Dukakis, but behind most of the other big winners. But another feature of that, which is which is uh, difficult even for academics who are allowed to be boring uh, to get hold of, is the denominator. That is to say, what percentage of the people who might be making endorsements are making endorsements? And that number was low for her. Governors were not making endorsements at all, one way or the other. So there was a substantial number of people who were waiting to see uh, whether Barack was going to have a glass jaw or not. That's the expression from boxing, where somebody's a rough, tough guy, but you hit him in the jaw, he goes down, glass jaw. Nobody, you know, nobody knows, and it's a tough, tough environment out there. He, he behaved well in it. He won in, in Iowa. And at that point, when Hillary was still expected to win, I mean, after Iowa, everybody still, and especially after she came back from in New Hampshire, she was still on in trade and smart money was still on her. That's when the flood of endorsements came, when she was still a front runner. It wasn't when, when Barack Obama had not won, but had shown that he was a serious candidate. That's when all the people who had been sitting on the sidelines came in. So the Democratic Party is split, but it's, it's not split between Dennis Kucinich and, or even John Edwards. Uh, and you know it's split between two liberals. Uh, and, uh, and they're going to let the voters decide, and that's as good as any way. I have views on all three. Good. Surprisingly to you. <laughs> first of all, on the first one, the insiders, I think I've said insiders are only part of this uh, equation. They are an important part, but so is, is media and message. And at the end of the day, uh, if he had no insiders uh, in any of the caucuses, Obama would have risen. Uh, because he had a message in his story. Uh, on the idea of regional interests, uh, does anybody here think that ethanol would be such a big boon to America if you didn't have an Iowa caucus? And, uh, and that's uh, had a huge influence because uh, most candidates who go to Iowa, A, have to support ethanol, and B, have to support uh, uh, farm subsidies. So uh, that does have an actual influence on the, the governing once they get into the presidency. As for the legitimate resolution of the Obama-Clinton race, um, I don't know why you would have superdelegates if you don't allow them to be superdelegates. Now they're saying that they ought to follow uh, the election results and, and let the majority rule. My sense is if you have superdelegates, the whole idea is for these wise people to make decisions based on who would be a better candidate. If I don't have a dog in this fight, quite obviously, but my sense of it is go to the convention, fight it out, argue it out, uh, do it the back rooms, front rooms, wherever you want, and let the superdelegates uh, decide the process, as was intended by their reforms and by their procedures. And they're going to figure out in a <laughs> sort of a sloppy, uh, incoherent way, probably will be able to pick the best candidate. And the back rooms aren't so bad in this respect. And by the way, we have, by the way, we have uh, between now and the August convention, what is that, uh, uh, four and a half, five more months. And uh, candidates make mistakes. Uh, Obama made a big mistake yesterday. He really stepped on his uh, message and was very condescending in Pennsylvania about why uh, Pennsylvanians don't follow the economy. 
So they make mistakes. I happen to think, it's my own personal theory, that he has a glass jaw. And I think the Democrats should have a lot of time to find that out. So I believe in the process. You go to the convention and, uh, and sweat it out. And at the end of the day, they'll sub I feel that by October uh, 15th, the party will be as unified as ever. Chris, should we skip you now? Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> Well, October 15th is unified as ever. We better do better than that. <laughs> um, I, um, look, I think this has already been the longest nomination battle since dirt. Um, I, I think, if, I think if, uh, if he had a, fatally, uh, a, a fatal glass jaw, uh, it would have been discovered. I think, if anything, uh, what he's been able to demonstrate is that when he receives a staggering blow, he's able to uh, uh, he's able to, to to stay standing and to and to counterpunch quite effectively. And uh, I don't mind the blows uh, because I think it just prepares him to be a more effective uh, president. Uh, and more to the point, he doesn't mind the blows. Uh, he's really quite calm. Uh, and uh, even serene uh, about it. Um, look, I'm, I'm married to a superdelegate. <laughs> so far. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and my view is that uh, she's going to come to her senses. And that what she and the other superdelegates ought to go here, I agree with Ken, is that they ought to, they should be, they're there to try to make, exercise their judgment about who they think can win. I think that's what they should be doing, who can win. And uh, my, I, I think where I would disagree is that I want them to figure that out in, in June, not at, the not at the end of August. I want them to figure that in June so that we have an opportunity to complete the vice presidential selection process and do all the other things uh, required in order to have the kind of unity that's needed uh, in, in the fall. She's a super delegate, but then again, I'm on the credentials committee. Uh, and I have no idea how to, how to handle that one. On federalism, I got to say that I think that one of the great dividends, again, of the extended process this year um, is the training, the exposure. The, the, I mean, these candidates, uh, talk about mine, I mean, he's getting to move all over the country and spend a lot of time in all these different states. I mean, look how much, he will have spent so much more time in Indiana because of this extended decision-making process than he otherwise would have. And I think that's great because he's learning a lot about Indiana. I mean, it'll obviously be great in terms of November and trying to perhaps be a little, little bit of a threat in November, uh, which would be remarkable. Uh, but more than that, after he's elected, he's going to have an understanding about what the people in Indiana are worried about that's going to make him a better president. Um, and that's, that's terrific. That's absolutely terrific. Will it make him more conservative? Um, <laughs> or more towards the middle as a result? I, I think you're going to, I think, I hope, I expect that uh, it's not going to change his values. It's not going to change his moral compass. What it's going to do is, is inform him better about what's at stake for a broader range of the American people. Um, I mean, I even saw that in 88 with Dukakis. Dukakis had no clue about dairy farming or about big agriculture. He didn't. He really didn't. But, when, but that's one of the great things about the federalism aspect dimension of, of an extended learning process through the primaries, is that you get to sit down with dairy farmers and really understand their economics and understand what, what, what competitive pressures they're facing and so forth and so on, and it changes the way you think about what's right for America. Um, doesn't change your values if you're, if you're the right kind of leader, doesn't change your values, but it does change your knowledge base and, uh, and who, with whom you can empathize. Okay, audience questions. Okay, great. So please I'm speak take, directly uh, into it. Three questions at one time. So let me just begin right here with this gentleman, and then we'll move down this row. I, I have a naive question, uh, but in all of the discussion, there was talk about uh, about financial support, about very much about expediency, 
uh, very much about changing values. But don't you think that the candidate should be given an opportunity or even required to present their ideals, their, their feelings about basic issues which face society? Uh, not the political expedient issues, but, but issues which are going to be around and have been around and which people all over the world need to contend with, think about, and deal with. Uh, I'm, I'm surprised that there is so much expediency, so much distortion by the media, so much dependency on the finances, and all of that almost you know, I, accessory I, sort of stuff right, let me, let me, to what uh, the candidate let me really is. To you, but let me collect two Thank more you. questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Questions. Thank you. That's a good question. Uh, in the, the lady in the back. Go ahead. This question is selected especially for uh, Dr. Zeller, I mean, Professor Zeller. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. Um, anyway, uh, Professor Zeller said, I understood him to say, that parties do the best work behind the scenes. The invisible primaries that take place three years before regular primaries decide, often subliminally, select the front runner. I myself had never heard of Barack Obama three years ago. Could you clarify that for me, please? This gentleman right here, and then, and then we'll turn to the panel. Right, right next to you. Yes, right next to you. Thank you, I just have to ask, do you see any chance for a dream Obama Clinton ticket, or is that be, we're beyond that now? <laughs> okay, so three questions: Co uh, opportunity to express core ideals, not just the political expediency. Second, uh, the invisible primary, and then third, Clinton Obama joint ticket. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, well, on the expediency thing, you know, I I think they talk about their ideals every day uh, on the campaign trail, and they hone this, and they do a lot of it in the early parts of the campaign. Uh, when they're with a very s small numbers of, of voters and they talk about all sorts of stuff. Um, an example, and voters get to see who they are. Uh, shortly before the New Hampshire primary, I'm up in New Hampshire and I go to the last rallies of Mitt Romney and John McCain. And I go to Romney's uh, rally, which was, I think was in Derry, and he has uh, you know, lost in Iowa and decided that he had to rework his appeal, and he was going to be, uh, instead of the sort of social conservative who'd been in Iowa, he's going to be Mr. Fix-It in uh, New Hampshire. And he, he had, his staff had hastily put together a big to-do list of 15 things that he wanted to do when he got to Washington. They only had 13 of them there, and the last one was in blue tape at the bottom. So it was a very, you know, quickly thrown together thing. And he talks about that. Okay, I go to John McCain's rally. Um, and it is, it's, it's out in the cold, it's in Exeter, it's outside, and it's due to the honor country. He just talks about himself, what he believes in, defending America, and it was a very simple message and it was all duty, honor, country. So if you saw that, you saw this one guy who, Romney, who perhaps hadn't thought about this deeply enough as opposed to just what kind of fixes he would like to, to do with his staff and, and him becoming the CEO of America. And with McCain, you saw something very, very different. And I think voters responded to that. And, and, and they got that message all the time throughout the primary. So, I mean, I do think that, that by the time one of them has won, uh, voters have a reasonably good idea of what their actual values are. I, I'd say that um, the principal reason I hate campaigns is because I'm a deeply committed policy wonk. Uh, and, uh, and I've come to the sad conclusion that policy has a very limited role. Uh, they're not on Ken's list. Uh, and it is, uh, and I think that's the reality. So I think it's important to distinguish between broadcasting and narrow casting. Uh, the broadcasting, uh, the best political advice I ever heard anyone give was uh, when we were doing a debate prep session for, uh, for Mike Dukakis and uh, Bob Squires uh, sat there and said, Governor, you have to recognize that the American people are gonna watch this debate, 
They're sitting at home in their living room and they're trying to figure out which one of these characters do I want with me in my living room for the, every night for the next four years. That's question number one. Question number two is about values, character, general sense of direction, like duty, honor, country. Question number six, nine, 13, is what's your energy policy, right? What, what, what's your program, what, right? And, uh, and I hate that, but it's not completely foolish. It's not completely foolish because sitting here today and trying to predict what are the key policy questions that are gonna be on the president's desk two years, it's not that easy to figure out. I mean, you can figure out maybe five of them, but beyond that, really it's that, the basic set of values, the compass, the character that are gonna make the, make, the, make the most difference. The narrow casting, and again, thanks to the internet, uh, Hillary and Barack have very detailed, elaborate policy proposals, and they're on the web. And people who are motivated to learn more than the media will feed them can go and read not just the speeches, but the position papers. They're even got footnotes. Um, it's a policy wonk's fantasy. Um, it's, ter it's terrific. Um, uh, increasingly now with YouTube and on the websites, you can even see a lot of this policy detail delivered in video, not just in print. It's great. Um, but it's not, what mo it's not the appropriate content for broadcasting as opposed to narrowcasting. I think that's just the way our, our, uh, our politics are working. On the dream ticket, no, it ain't just, no, I just, I really, it, it, to me it is unthinkable. And, uh, I, and these are two candidates, uh, both of whom are, uh, are friends of mine and both of whom I admire ter terrifically. Um, I'm supporting Barack in principle because I've known him a long time. He is a former student of mine. So is Elliot Spitzer. Um, but for a whole set of reasons, I can't see the two of them uh, sharing, uh, sharing the ticket. <laughs> Chris, I, I think, you know, I, I, I didn't say policy, but policy is a subset of your message. I mean, if, if you... Well, but I meant the, the policy detail, though, doesn't, doesn't get into your message, right? It's the general, we need a strong energy policy to make America secure. Uh, sort of a but, thing, I, but, but I do agree, I disagree that this campaign is full of policy and substance and I mean Byron's probably been bored to death on the campaign trail having to listen and drone on about economic policies and health care policies and everything else when he's really interested in the in the in the day to day race like every other political reporter. Uh, as far <laughs> deeply, deeply interested <laughs> in policy. Uh, and uh, uh, over drinks, uh, uh, talking about uh, Hillary's health care policy, I'm sure. The, the lady back there, I, I, I just want you to give one thought to this uh, about uh, you're suggesting that um, uh, about the insiders picking in advance. Some insider picked Barack Obama to deliver a speech at the Democratic Convention in 2004, and that helped make him, or it did make him. So somebody, some Paul, like me, made that decision that this young man would be a great speaker at the convention, and I made his made his career. <laughs> Chris Azar, you want to say a word about invisible primary, or uh, any I'd other like questions? I'd like to address uh, the values question also. Sure. Okay. Um, I think what Chris was saying about broadcasting and narrow casting is is obviously right. Uh, the the problem that the candidates face is that they have to appeal to people who are very intensely policy oriented and who are especially influential in the primary process and also win a general election where the swing voter, the middle of the road voter is not necessarily very policy oriented and is looking for someone who they'd like to have a beer with or be comfortable with in the living room. A very um, um, epiphany moment for me uh, in this regard came in the 2000 presidential debates between uh, Bush and Gore where um, Gore pointed out about nine times uh, that then Governor Bush's tax proposal uh, was going to give 50% of its benefits to the top 1%. I was watching that and I thought, oh, Bush is in trouble now. Gore really, that was a good way to put it. And how can you, you know, when you know, most of the voters aren't in the top 1%, 
you know, how can you survive that? Well, Bush survived that. He said fuzzy math, and he said that you have got this complicated targeted tax cut, and Bush and Gore came back, you know, 50% to the top 1%, and the newscasts talked about how Gore was a serial, was a serial uh, uh, liar and a policy wonk who couldn't connect to voters, and in the next debate, Bush, uh, Gore was talking about tax giveaways to the wealthy, which is a much weaker way of saying it. And I think that Gore knew what he was doing, that, that, uh, that the centrist voter is not a policy wonk voter, that you have to appeal to them with uh, some kind of a values statement that you embody in your personality. And Bush in 2000 was the compassionate conservative. Hillary is this working, she, you know, she is a liberal. She's, you know, she used to be really partisan. Now she's this working class woman uh, is her way of connecting to who she's got to win in the primaries and in the general. And Obama's got his unity thing, which appeals to a lot of different people without getting him into the kind of trouble that he would get into if he were talked about what his actual policy positions were. So the, the candidates have a difficult thing, uh, connecting to multiple audiences. On the question of, the, of, of Obama and the visible primary, I, I, uh, he emerged late, like I said, and, and uh, uh, but the, the only thing I want to add to that is that, is that he, there was a lot of inside interest in him. Uh, all, the, all the money that he raised from the very beginning of when he announced his candidacy, he was matching Hillary. And he was matching Hillary not from the millions and millions of internet donors that he was not, is now getting, but from Democratic mainstream donors who were often giving to both uh, candidates. So he got, he had, a, he had a lot of early insider support that people wanted to give him a chance to show his stuff. After he showed his stuff, mostly in the invisible primary, mostly in Iowa, uh, that slightly undemocratic venue there, uh, that's when then, then the, then the uh, flood uh, of, of uh, internet support, mass support uh, came out. I think on the, on the one thing on the values versus specifics thing. I think that values probably matter more for a number of voters, uh, including me, uh, after September 11th, uh, because a man who was elected on kind of a, a gauzy, compassionate, conservative uh, platform uh, instantly became uh, it became a commander in chief presidency. And I think we saw how quickly the point of a presidency uh, could change. Bush had really had no idea what he wanted to do as president after September 1st, 2001. He had already passed his tax cut. He had passed No Child Left Behind. And he was coming up with a, 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 a list of initiatives, kind of Dick morris size initiatives called Community of Character. Had nothing left to do as president. And then September 11th changed all that. And a friend who worked in the White House at that time uh, was deeply affected by the way something can change the course of your presidency. He said, you know, if, if you elect a guy, uh, he's sworn in, and then six months later, an incredible, enormous, world historic meteorite hits somewhere in the United States. It immediately becomes the meteorite presidency. And it's not what you, whatever issue was a big deal, like how to deal with our fabulous surplus was the issue in 2000. Um, so you do have to make these ju judgments based on your personal character evaluation of the candidate. Let's get some more questions. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, sir, and then we'll come back around this way. My name's Clyde Bird. I'm an alumnus, but uh, my, I'm going to make a, a statement and ask you to react to it. Okay. Uh, my impression is that you all find the system tolerable anyway, whereas it strikes me that it's resulted in disaster. Uh, the Vietnam War was a disaster. This present war is a disaster. Our energy pollution of the atmosphere is a disaster. Uh, and uh, I've come to the conclusion that it's not just a political system. It's that the American people's culture is corrupt. They, they're unable to, to see what the whole rest of the world sees. You know, the, the rest of the world saw that the Iraq war was stupid. The rest of the world sees that carbon dioxide does cause global warming. And uh, I don't think the system is tolerable. 
but I don't think it's going to change until there's a lot more drastic change in the culture. Thank you. Over here, this gentleman. Um, so, one thing that seems really important to me in this election are sex and race. Hi. Um, and I actually don't think sex is all that important. I think women really, from what I've heard and been reading, don't feel all that disenfranchised. But there's a significant section of the black population that really feels disenfranchised. There's this whole black separatist movement, and there's affirmative action, and there's all that sort of stuff. And that issue of race seems to me kind of the elephant in the tent. And it started to come out with this speech in Pennsylvania and so forth. And at this point, I, I support uh, Barack Obama. I'm a libertarian. He believes none of my policy uh, sorts of things. But I support him because I'm hoping that something can happen to improve this, this race situation. And so in terms of the primaries, I'm, I'm wondering how people feel that some big issue like that that's kind of a fundamental issue in American politics and American uh, life, how the primary system can support candidates that can be effective in, in a healing process like that. Okay. Um, in the back. Yep. The lady in the back. Hi. I'm curious to know how beneficial or destructive we might think um, McCain to choose someone uh, the opposite of him and um, on your question for Barack Obama to reach out across the aisle and choose someone like a Chris from, Gov uh, from Florida or a conservative. So uh, I'm curious to know, would that, do you, does the panel think that would be something beneficial or destructive to the candidate? Okay, um, so three questions. One regarding whether the public and political culture is corrupt, unable to uh, sort of, you know, uh, defy American exceptionalism uh, on a number of uh, important big issues. Second, uh, racial dynamics um, in the race. And then third, uh, choosing the Veep. Uh, should they choose somebody opposite from them? What are the pros and cons of, of that? On the uh, Obama Christ uh, ticket, which I don't expect to see, you got to stay with your team at a fundamental level. Uh, Washington is uh, organized in that way, and bipartisan, you know, people, a, a Joe Lieberman or a Susan Collins or Olympia Snow can be um, bipartisan a lot of the time, but when the crunch comes, they're always expected to vote for their team. When you vote for the Senate Majority Leader, you got to vote for your team. That's just all it is to it, or you leave. And I think in terms of a vice president, of course, that he would have to do that. Uh, on the issue of race, I think that is the big issue that, uh, that the campaign of the Democratic side has become. Um, and the question is, are voters voting more along racial lines than they were in the earlier primaries? In South Carolina, Obama gets 78% of the black vote. Edwards is still in the race. Uh, white men go for John Edwards. And, um, White women go for Hillary. Uh, after that, Obama starts getting well above 80%. 80, 80, uh, in Mississippi, he gets 92% of the black vote. In Wisconsin, a different place, he gets 91% of the black vote. Um, there's a huge, and, and this is, these are 90 plus percentages of bigger turnouts than were existing before. Um, the white vote, was originally more divided. Uh, uh, Obama gets 55% of the white vote in Wisconsin, wins uh, among whites in Wisconsin. 70% of whites Democrats in Mississippi vote for Hillary Clinton. 64% of uh, white Democrats vote for Hillary Clinton in Pennsylvania, uh, excuse me, in Ohio. And I think in what, we, what we're going to see in Pennsylvania, my guess, is that we'll see more racially uh, divided votes like that. I think the Obama comments that Ken uh, was referencing a few minutes ago won't help him at all there. Uh, then the huge question becomes, I think, North Carolina, which has, uh, I believe, 22 percent black population, much bigger than uh, some of these other uh, states in the north of the Midwest. Uh, Obama, if he gets 90 plus more percent of uh, the black vote, will only have to get maybe 28, 29 percent of the white vote to win. And I think that, that he'll probably do that. 
uh, and when. But the, the point is, is I think that uh, the, you talk to, I call up Democratic insiders or consultants, and they say, well, I think it's, a, it's more of a class thing, it's more of a culture thing. But these votes are dividing on racial lines uh, in some significant ways in some states. And that's definitely going to be a factor if Obama is the nominee. Does that, let me just follow up, does that, is that consonant with his message of unity? It's a political campaign, you know, they're going to, you got to vote for one guy or the other. The country, you know, the country split 50-50 in 2000, and uh, it might, it, even though all the indicators line up for Democrats this year strongly, uh, you know, you're going to have a very dem divided race. So, I, you know, this idea of somebody bringing us all together, I, I, you know, it's not going to happen in a campaign. So, uh, I think that, uh, look, I don't know, but um, back uh, 18 months ago, uh, I remember being interviewed by a New York Times reporter, and, uh, and I said, look, I don't, I don't know whether the country is ready. Uh, but, uh, and, I have, and I have serious doubts about it, but uh, I'm, prepared to, uh, I'm prepared to hope. Uh, and uh, th th this is the season for hope. And we'll have a primary process and we'll find out whether at least Democrats are ready. Uh, so uh, I'm still in hope mode uh, and the, uh, the internal polling and the head-to-head -head matchups for the fall uh, still lead me to be hopeful. Um, and I think part of it is that uh, what I also said to that reporter 18 months ago is that there was something about being, there's something about supporting Obama that I think makes many people feel good, not just about the candidate, candidates' views, or, but actually makes them feel good about themselves because supporting him is an act of hopefulness, and people want to be hopeful. Um, that's Ronald Reagan's success, right, is that he, he elicited a hopefulness with which people identified. Um, and I think there's something about the Obama candidacy as an idea that similarly uh, speaks to many people in that way, and that's an important asset, not just, but just that's an important asset, not just for campaigning, but I think um, ultimately for for leading, for governing. Um, I think that many people seem to think that after his race speech in Philadelphia, which I hope, if you haven't watched it on YouTube or haven't at least read it on the website, I urge you to do it. I think it's a phenomenal speech substantively, um, very rich. Uh, I think many people think he got a slight bump out of that speech, um, and it's because of the way he tries to engage in that healing, where he's speaking to different sides of the divide, trying to educate people across that divide, and that again is something that people want to see their leaders do, not just be the master of interest group warfare, but to try to engage us on a different plane. Uh, and I think that's all to the good, so I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that the voters, especially the new voters who are being brought into this process, um, will uh, feel very good about that. I, I guess I can't speak to the issue about whether our political culture uh, at large is corrupt, but what I, it's just too depressing to contemplate. But I absolutely feel that our system of governing, our governance system, is badly, badly broken. And how we do our campaigns, our presidential campaigns, is just one part of that broader issue of how we govern. But you can go back over the decades and see countless examples where we have failed as a political system to, uh, to appropriately identify and act against uh, crucial challenges in a timely way, uh, you know, whether it's uh, health costs or the SNL crisis or 
uh, global poverty, I mean, you, you name it, and over and over and over again, you can see that our system does not work effectively to spot and go after, tackle the toughest problems uh, in an effective way. Um. It's obviously important not to blame the nominating system for the culture. Uh, but one of the things that I like about the nominating system that I've said is good about it is that it uh, gives openings to change the culture, to provide leadership to change things that uh, people think are wrong. And another thing you have to recognize, of course, is that different people think the, system, the culture is corrupt for different reasons. I want to talk about the religious right again, who thinks that what's wrong with our culture is uh, uh, baby killing on the, as bad, that's as bad as slavery was, and secularism that's eating away at our society. Their response to that was to become part of the Republican Party coalition, to make themselves indispensable to the Republican Party winning Congress, winning the presidency. And so even though a majority did not, of the country does not, did not, does not share their view, they have nevertheless managed to get a, a hold of a, a political system and make some headway on that one. Now, people on the left, I think, should look at them as a, the Christian right as a model. Uh, if Greens or anti-war people uh, want to take positions that they think are morally correct, uh, but that are not popular with the whole country, the whole country is not ready to do what you know to follow the green agenda. But it, but you might be able, but it might be prepared to follow some leadership in that direction. Uh, people should uh, get themselves, make themselves indispensable to the Democratic Party, and to the nomination of uh, candidates. In the, on the Democratic side in the way that the religious right has on, on its side. So I think the nominee, and, and, and Iowa, uh, and proportional representation, and even the role of money, all are conducive to that, in my view. I think Obama has had a much easier time emerging as the probable nominee of a major party under this system than he would have in a one-shot uh, national invisible primary. So. <laughs> And go ahead. Uh, I'd like to address your question on the vice presidential candidates. Uh, I, I did a little history a couple of weeks ago of studying back to 1960. There have been 19 uh, candidates. Uh, one didn't make it, Eagleton, so that's why we have the odd number of 19. In those uh, 19, only one, can, one candidate, one campaign since 1960 actually has had the effect of affecting the, the presidential outcome. And that was depending upon whether uh, you think Lyndon Johnson either stole Texas or delivered Texas. Uh, 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 legally, uh, he helped w uh, Jack Kennedy win the presidency. After that, there's no vice presidential candidate. So in the law, as these professors will tell you, there's something called black letter law, which is these unchanging uh, principles of law. Black letter law of choosing a vice presidential nominee is do no harm. So you get somebody who don't, won't hurt the ticket. That's, in my judgment, rule number one. On uh, this gentleman's uh, support of Obama, which I find is, uh, uh, confirms what I believe, which, and what Chris said, which is he's a storybook candidate. He, uh, he is, uh, his election would let people think that uh, America is everything we read about in textbooks and, and what our history should be. Uh, Hillary is a storybook candidate, actually, because uh, young daughters are being told by their moms that uh, this is what you can be. And John McCain is what individuals would like to think of themselves uh, as brave and heroic and strong under the circumstances he survived. Um, as for this gentleman, I'm, I'm so sad you're pessimistic as you are, uh, uh, and I think a lot of it has to do with your own political view of the world. I mean, there's a lot of people, honestly, who don't think the Iraq war is a bad thing, uh, just as a lot of people thought the Civil War was a bad thing. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't think greenhouse gases cause global warming, and there ought to be an honest debate about it. Uh, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of scientists, uh, legitimate scientists, who don't uh, uh, say global warming is caused by greenhouse gases. That's, I don't think that's a debate that should end. And, and there's an arguable case that the Vietnam War had a lot to do with any of the Cold War. So I think the, the notion of American exceptionalism still is there, and we're still the best country that exists. We still have the best system of any other system. We have the best economic system. So I, I, I think uh, I would urge you not to be so discouraged and pessimistic about our culture. I think we'll, uh, at the end, as um, 
uh, we will prevail. Our time is about up. So uh, one thing I want to say is that I wish we could bottle, bottle this panel and bring them back in about six months uh, to see uh, at the end of this process uh, whether their predictions and their evaluations stacked up. Why don't you join me in thanking this August panel. Thank you for coming today. I also want to thank the panel for a very stimulating discussion wrapping up this conference and to our distinguished moderator and to all of you for coming. I just want to make two announcements. One thing is uh, for people who missed some of the other panels or maybe missed part of this panel, this is going to be webcast. It's going to be on our webpage, igs.berkeley.edu. Look under the events heading. Uh, President 2008. It will be up uh, in the coming days. And we're also going to have another conference this fall on uh, presidential powers uh, in war and peace. So uh, once we figure out who the candidates are, we're going to think about what they're going to do. Uh, so uh, we hope to welcome some of you to that one as well. Thank you all for coming.